Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. Earlier this week, the SNP Government published its latest economic strategy, and at the heart of this was tackling inequality. To do that, we need to expand opportunity, particularly for women. Can the First Minister tell us whether the number of women at college in Scotland is higher or lower than it was when the SNP first took power? First Minister. Well, I guess uh, people can guess the answer that uh, Kezia Dugdale wants to give to that question because she never comes to this chamber with anything that is good news. Her entire objective is to talk Scotland down. I am, I am very passionate about increasing opportunity for women. I thought it was something that Kezia Dugdale agreed with me on. That's why this government, for example, has been increasing childcare and is Mr. determined to Kelly. increase it even further over the next uh, term of parliament. It's also why we have been taking action to make sure that those who do go to our colleges come out of our colleges with a better chance of having the qualifications that equip them for the workplace. So we will continue to take the real action to ensure that women, young people and indeed everybody in Scotland has the opportunity we want them to have and we'll leave Labour to its desperation. Yeah. Okay, quite clear from that answer, President Officer, the First Minister doesn't have a clue how many places in college the, they've got. The reality is that under the SNP, the number of women studying at college all across Scotland has fallen by 85,656. The SNP's Order. cuts to colleges... Order! The member shouts rubbish. These are our government's own figures. 85 fewer women studying in our colleges. The cuts to colleges are hurting women the most. That's women who want to get a better education so they can get a decent job. So we know women are being left behind when it comes to education under the SNP. Let's try skills. And here's a wee challenge for the First Minister. Let's see if she can get to a whole answer without mentioning the Labour Party. Can the First Minister... Order. Let us hear Ms. Dugdale. Order. Let us hear Ms. Dugdale, please. Ms. Dugdale. Can the First Minister tell us how many women in Scotland started an engineering apprenticeship last year? First Minister. I think Kezia Dugdale's backbenchers would like her to go all the way through her questions without mentioning the position <laughs> of the Labour Party this morning. Can I again try to share with Kezia Dugdale some facts? And here they are. Scotland Order. has the... She might be Order. interested in this because I think it's rather important. Scotland has the highest female employment, the lowest female unemployment and the lowest female inactivity rate of any UK nation. That's a result of the action that this government has been taking. And let me give her... Some more facts about colleges. We are spending more on colleges today than Labour ever did throughout their entire time in office. We have delivered our commitment to maintain full-time college places and in 2013-14 approximately 14,000 more students successfully completed courses leading to recognised qualifications than was the case in 08-09. That's an increase of 33%. So we are delivering on providing the opportunities that women, that young people and people across Scotland need. And, presiding officer, this government will continue to do so. I'm glad she finally found the answer to the first question in her book. I asked about apprenticeships, presiding officer, and last year there were just 68 women who started an engineering apprenticeship. 25,000 apprenticeships in the last year and just 68 women learning to be engineers. So under the SNP, women are being locked out of the jobs of the future and being deprived of the opportunity to develop their skills. Maybe once women get into work, things improve under the SNP. So can the First Minister tell us how many women in Scotland earn less than the living wage? First Minister, dearie me, you know, let's 
address the point on skills in modern apprenticeships. Under Labour in 2007, there were just 15,000 people Order. starting modern apprenticeships. We are now delivering more than 25,000 every year, and we intend to increase the number to 30,000 by 2020. And I do want to see more women go into modern apprenticeships. I particularly want to see more women go into modern apprenticeships in careers like engineering. That's precisely why last Friday I was visiting GSK in Irvine to launch a campaign to encourage more women Absolutely. into <laughs> apprenticeships. And again, on the living wage, it's because we want to see more people, more women included, earn the living wage, that we are funding the Poverty Alliance to run the living wage accreditation scheme. And we're seeing growing numbers of companies sign up to that scheme and pay their staff yeah. the living wage. So I tell you what, presiding officer, yeah. we will leave Labour, who have had ample opportunities to tackle these things in the past, to talk about these things. This government will get on with doing them and delivering. Yeah. Okay, so Doug Deal. Mr. Doug the First Minister talks of ample opportunity. She's had eight years to do something about this. And on the living wage, presiding officer, and on the living wage, she was the minister who ordered her MSPs to oppose the living wage when we fought for it last year. The reality is, is that 264,000 women 264,000 women Order. in Scotland earn less than the living wage. That's more than a quarter of a million Scottish women locked into low paid work, struggling to make ends meet. The SNP's record on supporting women isn't one they should be proud of. College cuts hurting women the most, quality apprenticeships for young women lagging miles behind men, and voting against a living wage for hundreds of thousands of women in Scotland. Just saying you are for gender equality doesn't make it so. Hundreds of thousands of women in Scotland applauded when this First Minister walked through the front door of Butte House. But they are already wondering what difference it makes. The First Minister might know... Order. The First Minister might know that the theme of International Women's Day on Sunday is make it happen. When will she? First Minister. You know, this line of questioning on issues that are important might have more credibility coming from Labour if this wasn't the party that had resisted every single attempt to devolve employment legislation to this parliament. If this wasn't... The guilty man, the guilty man, there he is, the guilty if man, order, the guilty man. Mr Swinney. If this wasn't the Labour Party that had linked arms with the Tories to prevent this Parliament having control over the minimum wage. So this government will get on with delivering, making sure that we are providing opportunities, making sure that we are extending the living wage in a way that Labour never ever did when they had the opportunity in government. And I think it's because people see this government delivering, that people right across our country, whether they are men or women, are opting to support the SNP and have left Labour languishing in an obviously very, very desperate position. Yeah. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, when Nicola Sturgeon was Health Minister, the number of A&E admissions hit the 1.5 million mark, and she said that we had to act. So the Scottish Government introduced a new target of performance, telling health boards across the country to reduce the number of people attending A&E. In fact, she told this Parliament, and I quote, NHS boards will achieve agreed reductions in the rates of attendance at A&E between 2009-10 and 2013-14. Can I ask the First Minister whether she's met her own targets? First Minister. Well, can I uh, share some facts with Ruth Davidson on A&E performance? Uh, 11 out of our 14 health boards are treating around 9 out of 10 patients within four hours. Six of them are already meeting the 95% 
target. We have three health boards where there are significant challenges, partly, yes, as a result of higher winter demands in these areas. If you look at our two poorest performing health boards, for example, in Ayrshire and Arran, the rate of hospital admissions is more than double the rest of the country. And in Glasgow, it's nearly double that. That's why we are working intensively to support these boards to improve their performance. So I want to see people access care where it is most appropriate for them to do so. Where that is an accident in the emergency department, uh, we have to make sure that all of our boards, not just 11 out of 14 of them, are meeting the targets we set. And we also need to make sure uh, that where people require care in settings other than accident and emergency, whether that's GP services or by accessing NHS 24, they do that as well. So this government will continue to support our NHS to improve even further on the performance that it's already delivering. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With the greatest of respect, that was an answer, but not to the question that I asked. But it's okay because the Scottish Government's own website this morning has that answer. It admits that the emergency figures for 2013-14 are, and I quote again, the highest figure seen so far. So that was a target introduced six years ago that has still not been met. In fact, the latest figures out this week show that a &E attendance was up by 83,500 compared to 2008, and that is more than ever before. Now, I accept, absolutely accept, that we need a range of solutions. And the a &E staff that I spoke to this week told me that one of the biggest problems that they face are the people in the emergency departments who simply do not need to be there. Now, that includes thousands who clog up casualty simply because they've drunk too much. This week, we suggested that one of the ways that we could ease the pressure, and that was by setting up recovery centres so that A&E units aren't required to mop up after a Friday night out. Now, I know that the First Minister needs to use all her powers to sort this out, but will she consider this plan as part of the solution? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I remind Ruth Davidson that this government is reviewing out of hours care and I hope she will welcome that move. Secondly, I'm not sure and I assume not whether Ruth Davidson is saying that people who are going to A&E over the winter period are inappropriately accessing accident and emergency, but if she looks at the figures in depth, she'll see that the increase in people being admitted to hospital from accident and emergency suggests that people presenting uh, are ill people who require hospital care. On the specific question about uh, alcohol, I am very happy to discuss this in more detail with Ruth Davidson. I think it is very important that we don't have our accident and emergency departments burdened by people that we uh, don't want to see there and people who get drunk and uh, disorderly, we don't want to see them adding to the pressure in our accident and emergency departments. So, for example, we are providing investment to support the setup of safe zone buses in Glasgow and in Dundee and Edinburgh to try to provide that alternative care for people. But I'm happy to discuss this with Ruth Davidson. The final point I would make to her, though, is this one, and it's a serious point. Yes, we need to look at how we care for and deal with people who get into that position, but surely we should be trying uh, to ensure that we reduce the number of people who are getting into that position. And I, can, I say to her and to others across this chamber, if we're serious about reducing the burden caused by alcohol on our accident and emergency departments, it strikes me that one of the things we certainly shouldn't be considering doing is bringing alcohol back to football matches. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister, what can be done to protect the livelihoods of sustainable fishers in the inner sound of Applecross in my constituency and that of Dave Thompson's, when these local fishers who have harvested the area regularly will be excluded by the Ministry of Defence plan unilaterally to double the size of the Butec torpedo testing range there? First Minister. Well, Richard Lockhead, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, is writing to MOD ministers to stress the need to take full account of the impact of their proposals on local fishing communities and the marine environment before coming to a decision. He's also seeking to put the consenting of marine defence developments onto a more rigorous basis with formal involvement of the Scottish Government. And I'm sure Richard Lockhead would be very happy to discuss this in more detail uh, with Rob Gibson, who clearly has constituency interests in the matter. Jackie Beale. 
The First Minister will be aware that Police Scotland want to merge K&L divisions, creating a policing area covering over 3,000 square miles from Tyree to Clyde Bank. They were forced into consultation. They've refused FOIs. Um, they tell me that everybody agrees with them, but with no evidence to support this, and they won't even tell us when a decision will be made. Will the First Minister draw back that veil of secrecy, ensure that consultation responses are published before a decision is made, and that the Cabinet Secretary for Justice meets with local representatives? Representatives. First Minister. Uh, well, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary for Justice would be very happy to discuss this and other matters with uh, people with an interest, including uh, Jackie Bailey. What I would say on this is that Police Scotland were right to consult on this issue and they should consider uh, the responses to that con consultation very carefully. These decisions uh, are important decisions. They are obviously, uh, and for understandable reasons, very sensitive decisions and they should be taken with uh, the appropriate degree of transparency. Question three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. NHS 5 standards have been below target in 10 out of 19 areas since October, and performance has got worse since Christmas. There is an internal review, but as a former Health Secretary, she must have some insight into why people in Fife seem to be getting a raw deal. Why have things got so bad in Fife? First Minister. Well, NHS Fife, like many of our health boards, are dealing uh, with a range of challenges. And NHS Fife, uh, like all of our health boards, uh, is performing uh, well in meeting those challenges, but needs to be supported to do even further. That's why uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, discusses these matters regularly with NHS Fife and with other health boards. And we will continue to make sure that that health board gets the support it needs to appropriately meet these challenges. Well, Rennie. But, but none of that is new. There have been soaring levels of delayed discharge. Cancer and accident emergency waiting times have been missed. And this is critical. Our dedicated NHS staff are under increasing strain with alarming numbers of work in Fife. Patients there are waiting for answers. What is the longest she is prepared to wait to see Fife turn around? First Minister. Well, there is, uh, as the member will no doubt be aware, a plan in place between the Council and the Health Board to tackle delayed yeah. discharges. I think on, uh, if memory serves me correctly, my first day in office as First Minister, I spoke to the Chair of NHS Fife about this particular matter, and they are working hard, as are other health boards and local authorities, to tackle delayed discharges, because, as we all know, uh, tackling delayed discharges helps to tackle some of the other pressures on emergency services. In terms of the most recent uh, statistics, available uh, for the, the, those uh, for the week starting the 16th of February. The performance of NHS Fife against the four-hour uh, accident emergency target was 88.2%. That is not good enough, but we're working with the board to improve that further. Our NHS boards uh, do face challenges each and every day. This government will work with them each and every day to help them meet those challenges, and that is in the, the case in Fife as it is in every single part of the country. Question four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the MOD regarding environmental concerns on the River Clyde. First Minister. Well, according to the MOD's uh, figures, there were 105 nuclear safety incidents on the Clyde <laughs> in 2013-14. That's a 50% increase since 2012-13, which I'm sure is of concern to all of us. The Scottish Environmental Protection Agency regularly engages with the MOD about environmental issues concerning its sites, but the current legislation limits the role they can play. That's why we're proposing to legislate so that SEPA has the power to demand action from the MOD to enforce the requirements on radioactive substances. Mr McMillan. I thank the First Minister for her answer and uh, as she mentioned in terms of the, the increase uh, in safety incidents at Fires Lane uh, which was reported at the weekend uh, and also uh, of the nuclear convoys travelling over the Eskimo Bridge in January at a time when the bridge was actually closed to high-sided vehicles due to high winds. Does the First Minister agree with me that this dangerous act along with the environmental concerns it shows just how dangerous and damaging it is having these weapons of mass destruction in our waters and that's why it should be scrapped? First Minister. Um, I absolutely agree with that. The Scottish Government is strongly opposed to the possession of nuclear weapons and committed to seeing the safe uh, withdrawal of Trident nuclear weapons from Scottish waters. You know, the financial costs of the proposed replacement of Trident have been estimated at a staggering 
100 billion pounds over its lifetime. I think that money would be far, far better spent on initiatives to support our people and our economy. Uh, I was, I have to say, interested to see that most of Labour's candidates for the general election agree with uh, the SNP on the issue of Trident. According to a CND survey reported in the New Statesman, 75% of Labour's candidates are opposed to renewing Trident. Maybe one day their leadership will find the backbone to agree with the majority of their candidates. <laughs> Question five, Richard Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what measures the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that NHS 24 is able to recruit and retain the staff it needs. First Minister. Well, safe and effective staffing levels are a priority for all NHS boards, and NHS 24 is no exception. We work closely with all boards to ensure they comply with our requirement that they recruit and retain a high-quality workforce fully able to deliver high-quality services. There's a record high number of staff working in Scotland's NHS. NHS 24 staffing levels have risen by over 9% under this government. Despite a busy winter, NHS 24 has provided safe, effective support to tens of thousands of people when they have needed it. And I would like to take this opportunity of thanking all of the staff of NHS 24 for the work that they do. Richard Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that reply and join her in thanking the staff? But Professor Crooks, the Medical Director of NHS 24, was reported this week as saying that NHS 24's difficulty in recruiting nurses may make the service unsustainable in the long term. In 2007, Labour's last planned intake of nursing students was over 3,300. Why has she cut the intake of nursing students in every single year of this SNP government, resulting in 3,000 fewer nursing students being admitted to training? Isn't this another of our NHS emergency services being put in jeopardy by this SNP government's planning failure. First Minister. Presiding officer, the number of qualified nurses working in our NHS has increased under this government. There are 10,000 more people working in our NHS in total than was the case when we took office. Uh, if you look particularly at NHS 24 staffing levels, they've increased by 9%. NHS 24 staffing increased by 4.6% between September and December last year. And George Crooks, uh, given that Richard Simpson quoted him, said that we can absolutely assure the safety and effectiveness of NHS 24 services to the patients who call us. Uh, you know, that is the delivery of this government working with the NHS. And we will continue to work with the NHS to ensure that it continues to deliver high quality services to all of the people of Scotland. Leah MacArthur. Thank you very much, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the particular problems in recruitment of GPs in rural and uh, island areas. Can she advise the Chamber on what assessment has been done on whether in those communities there is more of a reliance on NHS 24 and therefore uh, will she undertake an assessment uh, of the potential impact on rural and island communities of any staff shortages in NHS 24? First Minister. Well, I think uh, Liam MacArthur does actually raise a valid point. It has long been the case that there are particular recruitment challenges in some of our more rural communities and certainly in our island communities. I'm more than happy that uh, the specifics of his question, which is asking for us to assess the impact of that on NHS 24, is something that we pick up in our general review of out-of-hours care, and I'm sure the Health Secretary would be happy to discuss that with him in more detail. Question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the National Trust, the John Muir Trust and RSPB Scotland's view that the planning process should be wholly independent of government. First Minister. Well, I'm not sure Liz Smith's representation of the views of these organisations is entirely correct. Uh, if you look at RSPB's website, they have uh, said that, of course, the government must have a central role in planning and in other nationally important decision making. We believe that local and central government have important and complementary roles in our planning system. In terms of an appeals process, we already have the respected and valued reporter, the Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals, who provide a separate process to that of the planning authority. We continue to engage with stakeholders to ensure that planning remains efficient, effective and inclusive inclusive with the majority of decisions taken locally. Liz Smith, uh, I thank the First Minister for that. I have the letter uh, to the Herald here. And what these important bodies and some others are expressing in that letter is their very deep-seated concern that the public has largely lost confidence in the planning process, that local communities who unite uh, to conserve our most popular and natural 
assets are frequently set, swept aside in an unequal battle with government and with powerful commercial interests. Does the First Minister accept that that is a very serious issue which undermines the very heart of local democracy and which can only be addressed if there is an involvement of an independent body? First Minister. Well, I also have the letter in front of me and I'm very happy that the government engages with the organisations that are signatories to that letter to discuss with them how we can further improve the planning system. But I think there's two points I would uh, make. Firstly, the vast majority of planning decisions are already made locally by those who are best placed to consider in what circumstances planning consent should or should not be granted. I think that is right and proper. And secondly, you know, planning, I think, does benefit greatly from being part of a democratic process, and it's informed at all stages by high-quality, objective and professional advice. So I'm happy to discuss the particular points with all of these organisations, but I don't think we should take uh, the planning system out of the democratic process. I think that would be a mistake. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On uh, democracy, does the First Minister share my concerns that if this proposal were to become a reality, and that democracy would be removed? There is, for me, no greater test of democratic accountability than the ballot box. And if people are unhappy about local decisions, they can take it out on their councillors or, indeed, on us in this chamber. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do generally agree with that point. That's not to say we can't improve the planning process further. This government has been working to do that over the past number of years, and I'm sure there is work still to be done. But I do think there is an important point of principle here that there needs to be democratic accountability in the planning process as there does in any other uh, aspect of government policy. So I think that is the principle we need to start with. But within that, of course, we should look at where we can make further improvements. Rod Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The published statement refers rather vaguely to improvements to existing planning procedures, including potentially the creation of a body or process that's truly independent of government, without any detail of the proposal. Nevertheless, some of these concerns might be alleviated by the publication of an options paper into the creation of an environmental court. What's the First Minister's position on that? First Minister. Well, as Rod Campbell says, the letter does very candidly and very rightly say that there is not uh, any great detail in the letter in terms of the proposal that has made. Uh, but as uh, Rod Campbell will be aware, uh, we committed to consulting on an environmental court in our manifesto and we will publish an options paper on an environmental court or tribunal later in 2015. We've already brought forward significant improvements to ensure that we have the appropriate structures in place to protect our environment and that of course includes changes to environmental regulation and planning policy as well as to the civil court system through the Courts Reform Act. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, given that the planning system at the moment is not wholly independent of government, would the First Minister agree with me that it's hugely important that the views of local people are taken into account by government when decisions are being finally decided when um, planning applications are being finally decided by government. First Minister. Well, I would say I, I do think there is a real debate here about whether the planning process should be entirely independent of government because of the points I've already made about democratic accountability. That may well be a debate this Parliament wants to have. It's a legitimate debate, but there are some big issues at stake in it. In terms of Elaine Smith's point about the views of local people, yes, of course, I believe that the views of local people are important. That's why I also think it is right that the majority of planning decisions are made locally, not by national government, but by those who are best placed in local areas to decide in what circumstances it is right to grant planning consent for a particular uh, project and in what circumstances it is not. Uh, we want to continue to make sure that there is that local accountability as well as the overall democratic accountability that I've spoken about. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister may well be aware of a planning decision taken in Ayrshire, uh, in Ayr, uh, famously known as the Plot 9 decision, uh, whereby the whole of the local authority uh, every councillor on the regulatory panel voted against uh, that proposal um, on air seafront, yet it was overturned by Scottish ministers. And if she's looking for an example of local democracy being allowed to have its head, she could seek no finer example of, than that uh, to hold her own ministers to account. Yeah. First Minister. Well, you know, there will be circumstances in, in which decisions are taken nationally. That doesn't change what I've already said, that the vast majority are taken locally. But when decisions do fall to be taken 
uh, nationally it is absolutely vital and it will have been the case uh, in the particular example John Scott cites that it is taken in line with the proper planning considerations. Uh, that's what is required to be done and that's what will have been done in this case but I'm very happy to ask the Minister responsible for planning to discuss the particular circumstances of this case with John Scott directly. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, there is outrage in Aberdeen uh, about the decision to proceed with Marshall Square against the feelings of, of people of that great city. Can I ask the uh, First Minister how we ensure uh, that people's views are taken into account uh, when uh, uh, councillors and others take decisions around about planning? Because in this case, the people's views are not being listened to. First Minister. Well, I, I certainly think it is the case that Aberdeen City Council could do with a few lessons on taking account of the views of local people. It has uh, appeared to be the case that they want to ignore those views uh, whenever possible. Can I suggest that as well as all the checks and balances and safeguards uh, in the planning process that are rightly there, it is also open to people when they get the opportunity at the ballot box to make their views known. And perhaps that's what people in Aberdeen should choose to do. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.